irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Question Reality with Priscilla Leona, right here on LA Talk Radio. And welcome to Question Reality. I am Priscilla Leona and I am producer and host of this show. And we are coming to you live from Los Angeles, California. For 11 years, we've been providing our audience with entertainment industry career advice. And this show is for you if you are questioning your career reality about pursuing a career in show business. Hi, Jason Kennedy from casting director of LA Talk, LA Talk, right? Wait, wait a minute, you don't cast for my show. L, wait a minute, NCIS in NCIS Los Angeles. Jason Kennedy is watching. Let me do a little wave for my boy. I love him. Hold on, Nikki Nicole. Oh my God, we're already popping over here. Okay, so again, for 11 years, we've been providing our audience with entertainment career advice. And this show is for you if you are questioning your career reality about pursuing a career in show business. And some of the guests include Emmy winners, Grammy winners, Tony Award winners, reality TV stars, producers, directors, casting directors, like our lovely Jason Michael Kennedy. Oh, hey, hey, back, Jason Kennedy. Oh my gosh, I get so distracted. I tried to do the show and read, and then everybody's just blowing up on the live, and I'm trying to get you in. By the way, Jason Michael Kennedy, look at this hottie that I have on the show today. I'm just going to say hi to Jason Michael Kennedy, Kazi. Hello, Jason Michael Kennedy. Yes. And um, our guests include Emmy, Grammy, Tony Award winners, reality TV stars, producers, directors, casting directors, talent managers, actors, singers, comedians, writers, PR agents, screenwriters, script supervisors, stunt people, entertainment lawyers, and the list continues. And if you missed any of our shows here, are three ways that you can listen to past shows. Go to our archive page on latalkradio.com website and search for the title of our show, Question Reality. You can go to iTunes, the Google Play Store, Stitcher.com under the podcast section, or get your free mobile app at the App Store or the Google Play Store, which I would highly recommend because there's so many great shows on LA Talk Radio. So you don't want to miss any of them. You're feeling a little flaccid. They got a sex therapist here at LA Talk Radio. You're depressed. You're on the couch. You've become a potato. They've got somebody here to cover that. Just go and check all the shows out on LA Talk Radio. I guarantee you there is something for everyone. Now, when you download the free LA Talk Radio um, mobile app, make sure that you, um, when when you download it, put it on your front screen because you don't want to miss me. You don't want to miss me. I'm available 24 hours a day as if you can't get enough of my voice. Yes, you can get me 24 hours a day. Finally, if you want to refer a guest or refer someone to be on my show, promote themselves or their products or help listeners with Sage Career Advice, we are currently booking for 2019, but you have to go to the official website, which is Question Reality Radio show.com not la talk radio.com uh la talk radio.com and that's the website where we air the show and question reality radio show is where we have the 2019 guest schedule and that's where you can submit for guest interview consideration on now let's move on now, as I just said, we have a hot, gorgeous guy today on the show. You know, I try to bring all the hotties on the show. I'm like Kazi's PR agent, Anka. She only has hot, gorgeous guys as clients. I'm like, yes, if I were a PR agent, mm-hmm. yes, it might be a microaggression. Hit me. Uh, you can hit me with the blue light on that because I will microaggression it up. I'm going to call a good looking man a good looking man. I'm not. Not politically correct people. Totally gener different generation. So Kazi, and I hope I pronounce this correct, Togenis. 
Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, He is an actor, writer, producer, creator. I want you to go to his website right now, kazitoginis.com. And let me spell that. K-A-Z-Y-T-A-U-G-I-N-A-S.com. You can also go to his other website, standingatethemovie.com. That's standing and then E-I-G-H-T, themovie.com. He's on Facebook at a Official Kazi Toginis, Instagram at Kazi Toginis, Twitter, Standing 8, uh, Facebook, Standing 8 Film, Instagram, Standing 8 Film, and he's also on IMDb. So you want to go there for a list of all of his credits. So just to tell you real quick a little bit about his bio, uh, Kazi's previous professions, which I found fascinating, um, were uh, being a restaurateur, and Lord knows you love, you know I love a good chicken leg, so woo, we're going to talk about the restaurant part, and what is so exciting, he was a Golden Gloves boxer too. Um, however, Kazi has always had a passion to act and write, so he decided to pursue, um, he decided to pursue that career path and graduated from the New York Film Academy. And Kazi has since appeared in numerous theater, film, and television roles. And some of the TV and credits include, oh, one of some of my favorite shows, Blind Spot, Law and Order Special Victims Unit, Blue Bloods. Oh my gosh, those are two of my favorites. Sneaky Pete, The Good Cop, Person of Interest, which was Albert's, one of Albert's favorite shows. And uh, some of his film credits include John Wick with Keanu Reeves. And you know, I told you about my Keanu Reeves story. Lovely guy. Love Keanu Reeves. Um, also in The Equalizer 2, starring Denzel Washington. And you can see the rest of Kazi's credits on imdb.com. He's got a ton of them. So go there and you can see all the rest of them. Lots and lots. And we're interviewing Kazi today to discuss his latest short film called Standing Eight. And Kazi created this film in honor of his mother, who has had lupus for her entire life. And he really hopes that this film will bring additional awareness about the disease and the overall devastating impact that it has on each person and their family and their friends. And Kazi is all Kazi. Oh, Lord, I've given him a new name. He's not Kazi anymore. He's Kazi. Caso, Caso the Lasso. Let me lasso Caso. I like it. Kazi is also the writer, producer, and lead actor in the film. And it's already won multiple awards. And it will be available to view shortly on Amazon Prime and various other digital outlets. So again, you can go to KaziToginis.com. So welcome, KaziToginis. Dot com. Oh my gosh, look at that. Stadium applause. Tacky but effective. I love it. I dig it. How are you? I'm I'm doing great. Oh I'm my great. gosh. Well, I want to talk first about these previous professions. Restaurant tour. Let's talk about that first of all, because I'm obsessed, obviously. I have a great love of the fork and spoon, as you can tell. And so, of course, I love, I watch all the shows. Gordon Ramsay's my man. Mario, Mario Batali, which I'm a little sad what happened to my Mario in the news of late, but I'm still a Mario fan. Um, so tell me, is this uh, something that you had wanted to do early in your life? Is that why you, how did you become a restaurateur? Well, it's a it's a funny story. I uh, I've always been very entrepreneurial minded. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in college, I uh, I I sold Amway products and <laughs> I I did uh, numerous things to make money. I worked at a deli and I used to I actually believe it or not I used to be a competitive figure skater. So I also sharpened skates. What? Yeah, yeah. Uh, through that was my sport of choice through high school and part way through college. Um, so I just always had like a hustle going on when it came to money. And I took this job uh, my last year of school at a diner called the Corner Diner, and I was working there. The owner was just exhausted. He, it's mm-hmm. like a 24-hour place right by the University of Delaware. It's, you know, dealing with a lot of stuff. You know, the night shift was, like, insane. And uh, that that summer after my graduation, he just turned to me and was like, would you, would you like to buy this place? Mm-hmm. And I was, I was 23, and, of course, I... I being 
on having that entrepreneurial spirit, I was like, yeah, well, I'd like to, but I, you know, I don't have any money. Um, but we were able to work it out and, uh, I ended up, uh, acquiring that restaurant and, uh, I was there for about four and a half years. And after it was, it was an, ins it, it was, uh, an incredible learning experience. Uh, it was incredibly stressful as well. Uh, I could go on for days telling you stories about that place. Um, but when my lease was up, unfortunately, my landlord didn't really look out for me, and I had to walk away. And uh, mm. in that process, kind of lost all of my money. And oh. that's what really opened the door for me to, to pursue acting. Because mm. I, I was forced into a position to make a decision about what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Well, uh, did you go into the next career, which was the Golden Gloves boxer, though? Mm. So yeah. I, I fought. I fought in the Golden Gloves while I actually had the diner. So I was, uh, you know, if I wasn't at the diner working, I was probably at the gym training. or um, and, and it was just a, a really good thing for me at that time because of the diner being such a, a huge source of stress in my life. Uh, I, I'm kind of aggressive as it is, and I needed a healthy outlet, and boxing served as that outlet. I, I trained out of um, Pennsylvania at Left Jab Boxing Club with Cliff Johnson uh, for the entire time that I that I did fight, and it's one of those things where it's it's funny that I transitioned from figure skating to boxing, but uh, I've never been a big uh, team player when it came to sports, so for me it was kind of like a natural progression, especially being um, aggressive in my twenties and. Punching people in the face and getting punched in the face can be an actually healthy outlet, <laughs> if you can imagine. <laughs> wow, I yeah. think I I think everybody should do it if they if they could. <laughs> Not everybody's got muscles, but I would imagine that punching is a is a great way in the gym. I would imagine it's mm -hmm. a it's a really healthy outlet. Um, now I did detect the East Coast accent. I'm from the East Coast as well, yeah. so I thought I heard a little pin up in there. Are you from mm -hmm. Pennsylvania? I'm actually I actually grew up in Chicago. Chicago? Mm -hmm. Oh, I hear. But you yeah. know, a lot of people in Chicago have a little bit of a. a yeah, they yeah. talk like this there. Uh, the you want to go down to the club over there? We're gonna we're gonna get a couple brats. <laughs> no, Whoa. I couldn't. Uh, uh, that's that South Sider thing. I can't. Uh, I can't rock with that. Are you from the South Side of Chicago? No, I don't no. Know what I that grew means, up. But... I grew up on the. I grew up on the West Side um, in Oak Park, uh, which is a uh, uh, known for its Frank Frank Lloyd Wright homes and the birthplace of Ernest Hemingway oh. for those that are interested in going on the internet and yeah. looking it up. Looking it up. Okay. So, um, so you boxed and mm -hmm. how long did you box? I boxed, uh, competitively from like 2000 and well, I started going to the gym at 2004 and, um, when I was there for, I don't know, like seven, eight months or so, I was getting ready for my first fight and I broke my nose really badly. So mm. I had to get surgery and whatnot. And that set me back for a while. But I really, I, I, you know, I was, I was steady going to the gym through 2008. Um, 2008 was probably my best season. Um, and then I let it go, which was really depressing because I had to go back to acting school. And when you fully commit to something, it's hard to balance multiple things at the same time. So um, 2009, I spent my my, uh, you know, all my energy in acting school at the New York Film Academy in Manhattan. And then when I got out of school, I didn't know really what to do because oftentimes you go to school and then it's like, all right, you're free. Yeah. Figure it out. Yeah. Uh, hit and, the cork board on your way out yeah, for a job. Yeah. And, uh, of course, being a new actor and not having any, you know, relatives in the business and whatnot that would be able to point me in the right direction or even mentorship at that time. Um, I just was like, well, I'll try to make my own stuff. And in the meantime, I'll try to box again. Yeah. Um, so I spent another couple of years trying to fight and act simultaneously. And I really wasn't doing either one well. Uh, so in 2011, I completely let the boxing go and then actually found a mentor for myself, Gwyn Gillis with the actor's market. And that was, that's really what kind of propelled me into like putting all of my, pieces together and following like a set path and being able to to move forward with with acting and entertainment she was a really great mentor for me 
Okay, so when so you obviously have always had a passion to act and write, and you decided to pursue that career path by uh, going to the New York Film Academy. And I believe you was it the conservatory you got the was it is it a degree you got or uh, it's a one year conservatory one- uh, acting certificate for okay. acting for film acting specifically for film yeah. And then you went on to appear in numerous theater, film, and television roles. Can you? Tell me what you enjoyed. Everybody kind of has a favorite. Some people are like, oh, my love is theater. Oh, my love is film. Oh, I love TV. They're all such totally different venues, and you've done them all. What Can you explain the differences between the three and uh, what you felt a passion for maybe most? Or mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. And would you, as an aspiring actor, which one would you personally recommend trying first? Would you go theater? Because some people are like, you have theater training. That's it. You 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 could film and television is a breeze. But then a lot of people from theater cannot acclimate to doing film and television. Yeah. Well, I think it really they they all offer their their own opportunities and their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I love theater. I love performing. Uh, I love getting in front of a crowd and, and, and being able to, you know, get into a character and, and, and and stay in the moment for pretty much, you know, whatever two, two and a half hours that you're going to be on stage Mm. and whatnot. And I really, I like that. I like just being there, being present. And Um, getting that instant gratification. It's so much different. And that again, instant gratification is a perfect way to put it because, you're, you get that rush. Yeah. It's short-lived. And the energy of the audience. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 a, it's one of those things where it's just like almost like a drug. And then, you know, once, you're, once the run is over, yeah. it's, 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 it's gone. It's past. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think theater is an excellent way to hone your skill set. And I would recommend for everyone to do so. It's also incredibly important just to help you get rid of that, you know, any type of hangups that you would have yeah right like you go into theater and you that's where you put in the work yeah because you're not going to put in the work when you're on set you don't have multiple takes you know Mm -hmm. you might you might be able to lay down a few takes like on a television show but you're not going to be you're not going to have all day to do it right right not not all day to get it down and I love the rehearsal time with theater as opposed oh, yeah. to, my, you know, you go go on the set for television. They're like, oh, by the way, all the lines you learn, uh, here's the new script. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's so stressful, very, I would imagine. Yeah, very different animals. And, you know, the prep that it takes for theater. It just you really get to explore a lot more with theater. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing, especially for creatives. Yeah. Film and television, it's it's very different. You know, I've been on, on a lot of a lot of sets at this point in time and uh television is very structured they they have you know the script and you better know the script when you're there and you mm. better say it verbatim um but then you might get on a show where you know creators like if it's something for like a streaming service where they're a little more flexible and they'll yeah. just be like yeah just you know whatever you come up with oh that's interesting we yeah. haven't talked about that yeah. before yeah. what do you mean by a streaming service being more flexible well you know when i worked on sneaky pete which is an amazon show the, the directors were you know they, they wouldn't come down on you know changing some of the verbiage and you know they were very open to ad libs uh which i really liked because when you're in character Things might just slip out. Yeah, you know, especially if you're really in it, which brings me to uh, to film, and film really is what I went to school for, and it's it is definitely my venue of of choice. Like if I had to choose, and I could only do one for the rest of my days, um, and it's 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 because I feel like you're you're usually cast and you're able to. I feel it's more collaborative. You know what I mean? Versus television, oftentimes you're kind of just filling a slot and you do that thing well and you, you know, you get a get a role, you do your thing and and then you're you're out. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like with film, you, you know, especially how the directors, are, depending on how they work with actors, you know, some are, are structured, but others really want to see what you bring to the table and how you create that character. So you're kind of given that that freedom to explore um, like you would on the stage, just not as long of a time frame you know if you can remember what your first audition was like what did you learn that helped you on your next one Mm. if you can remember because i know it might have been a long time so i actually 
before I actually went to the New York Film Academy, I decided to get my feet wet with auditioning. Mm -hmm. And I was living in Delaware at the time, and it was in between when the diner closed. It was like a couple of months in between. We closed November 1st, 2008, and I went back to school January 3rd, 2009. So there was this gap of time, which I was like, well, let me try to be productive or maybe try to book a little acting job or something, even though I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, so I actually started, um, I got what I thought was a headshot and, uh, uh, started applying to, you know, just, I got like on one of those services. Like I didn't even know that like what actors access or, you know, the casting networks was at that time. I just found some casting site and I started submitting myself and I got called in for on audition and it was to play a Russian bad guy. Ha! Huh, would you believe that? Oh, <laughs> Russian bad can't guy. Can't imagine. No way. Really? Terrible casting. Um, <laughs> so I um, I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. You know, it was like a week out because it was like an indie. So they had, you know, pr- plenty of prep time and they like sent over the script and I read it. And it was, a, it was a fun little short actioner based in Philly. And I was pretty excited for that. And I was like, well, with my boxing background and being able to do a Russian accent is very easy for Ooh, me. Oh, that is good. Um, so I figured... I got this. And I could even do accents back then. It was like, you know, one of my things. And uh, I ended up getting food poisoning. I got I got food poisoning from a very popular sandwich joint in Philly. Mm. And it was a few days before I was supposed to have this audition. I don't want to say it, but was it Gino's? No, don't say it. No, it wasn't. Okay. Gino's is very clean. Oh. <laughs> I love Gino's. I love yeah. Gino's, too. Um, so I... Uh, I get food poisoning and it's bad. Oh, like, I know. Um, I've had it twice. I, ooh, I was, whoo, I was hurting, and uh, that was before I knew about activated charcoal. Mm, oh, I never so. knew about that. I just laid there and wished for death. Yeah, wow. no, uh, I activated charcoal is definitely something I would, mm. you know, that's worked for me in later times when I my stomach was messed up. It just soaks up whatever you. Yeah. Um, right. but I digress. So we um. I had this audition, and I had food poisoning bad. And at the time, you know, it's like a 40-minute drive from Delaware to, yeah. you know, Center City, Philadelphia. It was at the, the audition was at the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia. And I'm literally, like, for three days, like, I'm throwing up, and I'm diarrhea back and forth. It's bad. And that day, I felt a little bit better. So I was like, I'm just going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to go for this. I had to pull over, like, three times on the way up to throw up. I got there. I'm in the elevator. I probably look white as a ghost, right? I'm like in the elevator and I'm like, it's like bubbling and I'm like, mm, mm, and like these people get on and there was like some kind of event and they're like, oh, are you an actor? And I was like, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I get off for the audition and I powered my way through the whole thing. They were like, oh, do you have any acting experience? No. <laughs> well, why? they were just like, wait, well, well, why are you here? And I was like, well, I, I box competitively and i was like uh and i can do accents and they're like oh well can you do a russian accent and i was like yeah give him what do you want me to say oh, that's good. So, so they gave me the, the the paper and i read this monologue and i went through the whole thing and they're like that was really good yeah. wow and they're like okay well let's bring the fight coordinator over and let's do some stuff <laughs> and I've, i'm like literally holding no! back trying not to throw up at this moment like i'm trying so hard oh. and the guy's like all right we're gonna do some kicks and uh you're gonna throw some, some punches and like i was oh. fine just standing there right like i'm like mm, uh, uh. and then as soon as they were like we're gonna i didn't i didn't but it came close like, and i think i totally played it off because they had no idea they wanted to talk afterwards oh, and we're just like God. kind of chanting it up and the entire time i'm like thinking, i'm gonna i'm gonna throw up like right in this mm. room and like i turned around i walked to the elevator it was kind of like a and i like pressed the button and it i was like <laughs> And got in and got out of there. But luckily, I, oh. I made it through. But that was my first audition. Your, that was your greatest acting job, that trying was, to get through that audition. They had no idea how sick I was. <laughs> but that I'll never forget that, because that was my first audition. And and um, do you still get nervous about going on auditions? And if so, what are some techniques that you can use to combat that? Because a lot of people get so nervous. You know, I don't really get nervous anymore. Okay. Um, I think of, I think of auditioning as a as an uh, opportunity for you to perform, and I think people get nervous when they put pressure on themselves to book. 
I think that mm-hmm. you have zero control over people's perception of you. Mm-hmm. I think that they're going to make up their mind as soon as you walk in the room. I think they're going to, you know, they're going to look at your headshot. Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll look at your resume if they have time. But for the most part, you just need to look at it like I'm here to do what I can do, to bring what I can to the table, and let me put on a little show. Yeah. And if they like it, you know, great. And if they don't, so what? There'll yeah. be another audition. Yeah. There'll be another opportunity. It's just I think, not right for you. Yeah. And I think you're going to book what you're meant to book. That's and right. I, I think yeah. that's a really hard, um, hard thing to accept because we want to book. Yeah. And we want to work. Yeah. And we want to be working all the time. But everyone has to go through spells when they when they don't book. And it's just part of the game when you're an actor. It's part of what you have to get used to doing. Yeah. And, and you can't take it personally and no. feel like you've been rejected. Because no. casting directors want you to do the best. Because as Absolutely. soon as they cast you, they're on to their next role. Yeah. So they want that. But a yeah. lot of actors, they're so intimidated by casting directors and going in auditions. And they think that the casting directors got it out for them. All they don't want them to do well. But that's not true. Casting no. directors love. They're like so happy when the next person comes in. So yeah. actors, please remember that. Casting directors are your best friend they believe are. it or not they're they definitely are. the gatekeeper they, definitely, they are and you, they know what they're doing yeah. so if you weren't cast you just got to accept that they know the right person for the project and you just weren't it so yeah. in, in better luck next time so yeah. think of it as not booking the don't think about booking the project think about yeah. booking the room yeah win the, win the room just have fun and show them you can and do i always can. say well if you didn't get booked you should feel happy because you probably may not have done the best job that you could do and represent it yourself well as an actor. It wasn't, it wasn't right for you. Now question, there are, um, how do you feel like, uh, how do you successfully market and network yourself to directors or producers? What do you think is the best way? Because a lot of actors, when they meet producers, directors, like in social settings, they are, so intimidated and nervous and some of them just reek of desperation and you know they can smell that a mile away you yeah. just want to be natural how do you do it what do you think you should do i think this is one of those things where you have to be confident in yourself as who you are as a person and confident in yourself as a performer um you're uh, pr- producers and directors and casting directors and grips and production assistants and cinematographers are all people. Yeah. Actors are people. Um, and by idolizing or putting too much weight into stuff, uh, the energy is just going to be off. Yeah. And it's really about just your energy. And the truth is, if you come to people with an agenda, they can always smell oh, it. Yeah. They always know in mm-hmm. their gut that this person wants something from me. And you can't you can't do that. No. You're, you know, I know it's hard. I know it's hard out there. There's some people that are not booking. I know that they've been they, and they've been on a in in the in the dumps and things aren't working out. But that doesn't reflect necessarily that you don't have the talent or you're not good enough. It's just timing. Yeah. So if you do meet people that are involved in the industry, you treat them like you would any other people. Treat them how you would want to be treated. Be natural. Yeah, just be Be yourself. yourself. And if you had to say, what are three characteristic traits that you feel it takes to be a successfully working actor, like booking? I would say, obviously, you got to be persistent, tenacious. You know, what, what else do you have to do? Well... Um, I can't really call myself a successful actor, you a successful working are. actor. Uh, I've I've just I, I consider myself just blessed and very lucky to be in the position that I'm in now, and I'm very grateful for it. So I think. For, and you wouldn't have booked the roles that you have if you weren't successful in some, <laughs> come on, in some element or level you have. Because I mean, not, I know a poor guy. God bless him. He. He went on 25 auditions, didn't book one thing. So I said, keep trying. It's just you haven't found the right thing. A lot of times, people, you don't know how to brand yourself. That's what it comes down to. Um, It's just like when you're on American Idol. You go on there and you think you're the best singer ever. And you go on there and you're really honestly not 
that good, but you believe in your heart and your soul that you're the best and you argue with the judges and you argue with everyone and, and you just have to be, take a realistic view and take stock of yourself, but brand yourself in a way that is realistic because honestly, looks are the first thing that you're called in for because the look of the character Mm -hmm. is something that has to be there. But that's not always the case. There's a lot of times when you get called into an audition and they want this look, but you come in and rock the hell out of that role. And they're like, you know what? I never saw the character like that, but I like it. So, you know, that happens a lot. Yep. So I would say don't limit yourself by the physical description. If your agent wants to send you in or, or they're calling you to come in and you're like, why are they calling me? Go in anyway. You just never, ever know. Exactly. And For Equalizer um, 2, um, the original breakdown for the Ari character was Israeli. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, Let's talk real quick about that. Then we're going to move on to your film. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so you were an equalizer, too, with my Denzel. (laughs) Um, First of all, I assume you have an agent. So they called you and sent you in. I had a I have a I have a manager, um, uh, Nicole. We've been together since 2014. Uh, She's my ace. um, And I appreciate her so much. so at the time, I actually had auditioned for Equalizer 2. I actually auditioned twice. I auditioned for a different character um, that they saw me for, which I didn't really think I was right for, but of course I laid it down because the character was Turkish and um, laid it down, let that one go because I was like, well, you know, I just auditioned for a Denzel film. That's pretty cool. I was pretty yeah. excited, you know? And uh, shortly thereafter, I ended up booking an episode of Sneaky Pete, which was in... Uh, shooting in Connecticut at the um, at the Mohegan Sun Casino, and it was a really it was such a roller coaster of a time. I was still working as a waiter at that time at uh, Cipriani on Forty Second Street in Manhattan, and I booked the Sneaky Pete. So of course I got to go to my boss and be like, "So um, uh, I'm gonna need to uh, take <laughs> off a few days." And you know, my boss was she was cool, and she's like, "All right, do what you got to do." And I was like, "All right, I'll see you on Friday." And um, so I take off. I go to the Mohegan Sun. Unfortunately, at the at the time, my uh, my best friend who actually worked at my diner for a few years, he moved out from Chicago to come work for me when I had my diner. Um, Dion, uh, his 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 father passed away, mm. and it was while I was en route to set, and. I knew I had to, you know, I booked my ticket to turn around and go back to because sh- his his father was in Chicago, and it was it was really tough because I I really felt like I needed to be there for him, and we, uh, you know, I just I'm holding it together. This is emotional, but I'm holding it together while I'm on set, and I just did everything that I had to do, and we wrap, and I head back to New York, and I, that was like what a, a Thursday, so Friday, of course, I go into the day job, and I had booked my ticket to go back to Chicago on Saturday. So on Friday, when I get out of work, I'm just trying to lay low, just trying to just mellow out before I got to fly back to Chicago for the services. And I I go out to eat um, in the evening with my roommate, and I get this email at like 8 o'clock at night. Hmm. And it is to audition to play Ari for Equalizer 2. Audition number two (sighs) for the film. And... It's a self tape and it's due on Monday. I have to be in Chicago the next Whoa. day. So I had one chance and I was like, well, I could try to lay it down when I'm in Chicago, but I, that means I'm going to need to find like a camera, yeah. a backdrop, all this stuff. Yeah. I was like, but I don't want to be spending time trying to do a self tape when I need to be with yeah. my friend. Like, th- I was like, I could do that. Right. So quick, quick decision i gotta lay this down same night yeah so i got my little self-tape kit out i called my good friend nadia um and she i was like do you think you can come and take me for uh, an audition tonight it, it's for denzel and she was like what yeah and boom <laughs> hell yeah yep 9 30 at night we're in there i couldn't memorize all the lines in that moment so what i did was i did a brando and taped the sides all over the place on the camera on the floor wherever and we laid the audition down um around midnight i sent it off you know after you 
edit it and export and whatnot. And I, I kind of let it go and then went back to Chicago and it was, it was a really, really tough weekend. And I had to come back that Sunday night to go back to work. Cause I'd already taken all these days off for sneaky yeah. Pete and emotionally it was, I just really felt like I needed to be in Chicago for my mm. friend. And I was in a really bad mental place, mm. like mm. dreading going into the day job, mm -hmm. you know, working. And that was like Monday. I was just like angry. Tuesday rolled around. I was angrier <laughs> Wednesday. <laughs> oh I was like God. really getting there. And by Thursday, <laughs> Thursday of that week, I was probably the most miserable human being that anyone would run into. I, I was hating the job. I was resenting the fact that mm. I had to be there instead of being with my friend mm -hmm. and being with his family. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, 1 p.m. that day, I remember looking up at the ceiling and I was like, please, God, get me out of this job. And 3.30 p.m., Nicole calls me and she says, hey, I got some good news. And I was like, oh, what, what, like Sneaky Pete's bringing me back? And she was like, no, you're going to be acting with Denzel Washington. Yay! Wow! And that was... Uh, that was it. Snapped yeah. you right out of that funk, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, let's, let's talk about the excitement that's been happening. I, of course, went to your premiere on Thursday yeah, yeah. for Standing Aid. It was such a huge success. Uh, Anka did such a fabulous job getting everyone there. And, and I'm not sure who was in charge of organizing it, but I know that uh, my friends and I were commenting on what a uh, top notch event it was i mean they had glitter popcorn and that's like for me that's like a top-notch thing they had um those little sliders i'm telling you they did it up i'm telling you kazi did it up he did it up um so it was at the arc like theater on thursday and it looked like it was really a success um love the movie i thought that it brought about a lot of um i thought it brought the issues of what the core of the movie was about. I thought that you really covered that in the movie. And I wanted Thank to talk you. about uh, the title, which a lot of people were saying, what Standing Eight means? I'm, I have no, well, we'll find out. Okay, so the movie is Standing Eight. I do know that there was a Q&A afterward, and you did say that that was a boxing term. Correct. So let's just briefly, uh, can you tell us about the film? Now, what I know about it so far is that um, you created the film because, why don't you tell us the, the reason you created sure, it? I don't sure. want to tell that. <laughs> I, I I wrote uh, Standing Eight and made the film essentially because my mother has lupus, and at the time, uh, and even still true today, I felt that lupus was not being represented in pop culture at all, and I just really wanted to do a project to give back uh, to my mom for all of her support all these years and being there for me, and I, I really just wanted to do something that meant something to her. And it just, it became, it became a thing. It became a, it, it, it's become uh, all that I really had hoped for it to be. Mm -hmm. And the reason the event was so beautifully run uh, was because the Lupus Foundation of America put it on. And for them, it is um, a, a very important piece because there has never been a film before that's had lupus as a plot device. Are you kidding me? No. Since no. the beginning of time, there's never been a film. None that I know of and none wow. that they none know of. None that they Oops. know of. Yeah. Wow. Um, there's been some television shows that have mentioned lupus. Um, there was a, uh, I think General Hospital now might be, no, I don't remember. Maybe Days of Our Lives. I can't, I don't quote me on that, but there was a, um, there was a storyline with a, a couple of characters that had lupus um in the 90s well at first i thought that this was um when, like a true film and it is in that uh it's about the truth of lupus but uh tell us briefly about what the film is about sure. now you wrote it mm -hmm. you produced it and you star in it yes so yes. tell us what it is about sure loop um well i'll talk uh, first i'll tell your listeners what lupus is and yes first, i think that they yes. should get some context lupus is an autoimmune disease that um, wherein your body's immune system, your white blood cells, attack healthy organs and tissues instead of, instead of attacking bacteria and viruses that invade your body. 
and it can attack any organ. It can be fatal if there's a flare. Um, and it is, there are actually really drastic treatments that people can take. Like, like you can get on chemotherapy or prednisone, which is a, is a harsh steroid. Um, and my mother had it since before I was born. So standing eight is about a professional boxer in the prime of his career. Uh, and he gets diagnosed with lupus right before the fight of his life. And the story is really about him. It, yet we, de we do deal with uh, the physical effects, some of them. Um, but as in one of the scenes, it's explained that he has a mild case, but he's still unable to box um, for safety's sake. He could potentially die if you overexert, if you have lupus, cause a flare, and could be fatal. So the, the story is really about him dealing with the psychology that he can no longer do the thing that he loves. Mm -hmm. And then you have the antagonist that's not believing it and thinking that your character is trying to bail out of a fight because you're scared of them. So I thought that that really, that was, that, that was, God, they were all really good actors in this <laughs> film. Everybody really rocked their role. And I thought that, um, that, that, that really kind of, um, is the mindset of a lot of people because I have a friend who has lupus, which by the way, I want to do a shout out to her, Patsy Black or Patsy um, Parker. Can you say hi to her? Because I told her you would. Of she has course. lupus and she's having an operation on Monday oh, no. to have a stent put in her brain because it's, you know, dr to drain. I'm not sure. I think it's lupus related, but there's water on her brain. She's having an operation. So I said that I would have you say hi to her. And hey, Patsy. 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 Patsy, hello, and we're praying for you, and it's going to go fine. You're going to be okay. Yes. And so a lot of people, believe it or not, um, they think that people with autoimmune diseases that are not always, like, physically um, give physical symptoms, that they use it as an excuse mm -hmm. For to get out of work, to take off work. I was shocked to hear that. I mean, because they don't have the disease, they can't relate to that. Until you have the disease, you do not know what it feels like. And just because you can't see it does not mean that it is something that you should not give um give awareness to and be sensitive about because autoimmune diseases are becoming now I didn't and this was a question unfortunately I thought of it at the last minute and I didn't get it in at your premiere but um there are the World Health Organization has now said that autoimmune disorders lupus rheumatoid arthritis just tons of autoimmune diseases have become that would have been dormant have become active with the cell phone with the is what is it albert with the in in uh with the radio the radio frequencies yeah and they are warning that people who don't even have say lupus a lot of lupus that runs in their family such so was your friend not natalie i believe she said that it did not run in her family at the Nadine, q a Nadine, yeah, yeah. yeah and we're seeing that um a lot in the world health organization is saying once they put in the cell phone towers 5g Autoimmune disorders are going to be eat, pumped up even to 17 to 23 percent more. So, um, yeah, well, those 5G towers are supposed to be what 100 times more exactly. powerful than 4G. I don't even understand how and that's they happening. are, don't even get me started. Yeah, and that is what the they're saying that they have seen autoimmune disease like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and all of these other diseases that would have been dormant may have been in your body and, and had lain dormant that they are all of a sudden being um, your, they're coming alive, so to speak, because of the um, ignition of, what is it? I, I can't think exactly. I'm trying to think of what this seminar was about. But basically, these these autoimmune diseases are really being sparked by the microwaves that are going through our body. And they're just 
worse than ever. And the 5G towers are really going to cause so many autoimmune diseases to be, you're going to not even get any kind of effects from medicine like hydrocodone or ibuprofen or even steroids, because it's just constantly going through your body. Remember, these are invisible microwaves. They're coming from the satellite, from the sky. They're coming, they're going through us now, and they are sparking a lot of autoimmune diseases. And um, so... I thought I would bring that up. Have you heard that yourself about? I didn't hear about the increased um, yeah, the... numbers in autoimmune, but I've definitely been very skeptical of IG towers. Yeah. Um, I, it... I just, just based on what I've read, I'm like, that does not sound like a good idea. And I don't understand why. Yeah. And no they're, they're really... really, I mean, autoimmune diseases. And they have to actually put more towers. Right. Yeah. Because they're around. short. Right. Yeah. It's short way. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So... They, like there was just that school in, in California right here that, that, that they pulled the tower out because a bunch of kids were getting cancer yes oh, right? i didn't hear about yeah. that yeah right i yeah. can't remember where it was but it was like there was like a disproportionate amount of children getting cancer because there was a cell tower right like in the middle of their playground yeah, yeah. so you're thinking about well that's a 4g tower yeah well what's a 5g tower gonna do and no no one is questioning this what's yeah. going on i don't understand i know it's terrible i think there uh, are uh, some uh, people who were saying that they should hold off on that some scientists i was reading saying they we, we should hold off on that yeah and then uh examine it more i uh, i 100 percent agree yeah. i don't understand how you know what if there's a question to the health of the public why would they be able to yeah. continue without more research and i'm talking about <clears throat> um you know, research that is unbiased that can tell us whether or not these things are safe. Because yeah. I've already questioned the safety oh, yeah. of 4G towers, look, especially. Look into that. Uh, Google that about autoimmune disease like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis are the two that the World Health Organization. My mom goes to seminars a lot. So, mm. um, you know, it all of these, uh, wor the World Health Organization is trying to warn you. If you think that you have diseases now that are dormant, wait until the 5G towers go up. Oh, you, t you tell the story about crazy. how all those uh, students oh. were wearing. AirPods when they came into the seminar. I know, and when they and left, them, yeah, them nobody up. had an AirPod. I mean, I'm not. I, I, that was another thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. Bluetooth AirPods. Those are those. That's a radio wave that yeah. you're actually putting into your inner ear. But people, you know, they're selling it to you like it's cool. It's yeah. Not. They take away the little thing, the little, and they force you thing. to yeah. use it now. Like yeah. you actually have, like some phones, you have that's to now right. get. The, that's the right. ear pods and have yep. radio waves sent into the center of your brain. I don't yep. understand. That's why I haven't upgraded. I still got my six. I got I still got my jack. My, I don't my understand. Like, I don't understand what's going on away. Eh? They're they're killing us, is what it is now. Um, okay, so um, the Let's, film is doing extremely well. Back to a positive. Back to a positive. The stream's doing ex uh, the film's doing extremely well. You are bringing awareness about this disease and the overall devastating impact that it has on each person as well as family and friends because no disease just affects a person so i think your film really really was poignant in that area i think you did a great job incorporating that into the script Thank and you. now what is the overall goal with the film i know that you had said that it's going to come out on amazon prime has that happened yet yes it is available now on amazon yes and amazon and vimeo and we will be expanding to itunes and google play later this month wow so if you go now to Amazon Prime, you'll be able to to watch Standing Eight, and you definitely got to see Cosy because girls, there are some shirtless scenes up in there. <laughs> Make sure you get a cocktail and some glitter popcorn. <laughs> now, um, after this film, now this I'm not sure, but I think this was your first writing, producing. Uh, acting it, it, the act combination or was it? it it's uh it's actually my fourth okay fourth i've done you know when i first got out of school i i did a short called salvation road and then um a couple years later uh ventured into feature land and did a uh i co-wrote and produced and acted in a, a feature called terminal legacy and then I actually did a follow-up, a short film follow-up to Terminal Legacy, which I directed, which was uh, found footage. So I've directed, I've actually directed two shorts and produced a feature, and this would be my fourth project through. Um, which do you like films. best? You like doing them all at the same time or just focusing on the acting? Um, I mean, it really depends, you know, project to project. Like if I'm going to write something, yeah. I'm writing myself 
uh, the lead role and I'm going to make right? it happen. Like I don't, I'm, I'm, pro- I'm producing things with myself in mind um, because nobody's going to do it for you. That is so true. I mean, you've got to be a pioneer. You really do. If you're, if they're not beating your door down, you got to beat your own door down and you got to do your own projects. And Kazi was talking about at his premiere, how he, um, uh, did Kickstarter mm-hmm. and uh, he was very successful with that. Did you do three, two? two. I did two, two successful and, Kickstarter. Yeah, I did yeah. one in, going into production and then we did another uh, Kickstarter promotion for uh, post production. Yeah, so do it. If it gets the film done, do it. Now, I heard, that means we got to go. I heard, we got five minutes. I heard the scoop that you have a big net. Netflix film with Eddie Murphy called Dolomite is my name. And I don't know if you can tell us anything about it, honey, but whatever you can give us. Is it a film, a television show? Is it on cable? You can at least tell us that. What can you it, tell us? Uh, there will be a film on Netflix that I'm in, and that's pretty much all I'm allowed to ah, say. But I love Eddie Murphy. Or, or at least are you in a scene with him? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's good enough. And we don't know. But when, when will we hear about it? I have you no know? idea. There's we, You'll we be promote will blackout. you be promoting it or or you know, coming to do it like yeah, a as soon as I know a something, promo tour. Yeah, as soon as I know okay, something so and I'm giving let the us okay, know. I'll I'll uh let me know and I'll be promoting it for you. Yeah. So standing eight the is the standing eight the film dot com. Standing eight the, the movie, movie the movie dot com. And I just want to put this like can you hold this? Can Absolutely. you like okay? Because so I can get a bit. Okay, so there it is. Standing eight. Uh, that was the premiere. That's why you're looking. It's over. And oh, I don't. Is on the back. Is that where the awards are? Is there anything on the back with those laurels? No the film we laurels. Don't, no. Oh, okay. So well, anyway, just know that he has won a ton. Of awards, right? And it's still going. You're still in film festivals. Uh, we we actually finished up our film festival run. I don't know, maybe like six months ago or so, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you I submit focused... to my film? I'm uh, I'm a screener for the Burbank International Film Festival. Did you submit to Burbank? I did not. Well, honey, you gotta make <laughs> sure that you submit to Burbank. Not okay. saying that you can, you know, that your film would get in or anything, but uh, also, well, why don't you submit it to my other one? I'm also a judge for NSAEN Film Festival. So, okay. next time. Okay. All right, but if you're still submitting, it's not too late. I'll take it. We'll take it. Um, but, um, and also, I'd love to uh, be a donator or help out on any of your future films. So, oh, contact you. me directly. Thank you. You need some cash. We'll just hook <laughs> you up. Right, Albert? We'll donate to a college's film. Okay. So, last question is what is your dream role? Wow. My dream role. So, if anybody's out there like Jason, hey, Jason Michael Kennedy, you're still watching. You got. He does action. You do boxing. You do. I would imagine you do lots of other. You know, they're, they're, those shows are very high impact. Yeah. Like, you well, know, you're familiar with NCIS and NCIS Los Angeles, yeah, of course. So you would totally fit on there. Call him in for an audition, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> what, I'm available. You're available. But what's your dream role, real quick? To be honest, um, my dream roles are pretty much just being able to see anything that I've written for myself come to life. Mm. I, I just, I, I enjoy challenging myself and, um, but I also enjoy being challenged by others. So I'm very, I'm very open to a wide spectrum of whatever, whatever directors see me as, because I've, the, over this course of this last year, right, I played a role in that movie that you brought up. Standing I, mm-hmm. uh, Of course, a boxer, yes. You know, I had Equalizer Professional Assassin, I had, uh, what did you do in John Wick, by the way? We didn't I even talk just, about I was Keanu. a goon. I was a, a goon. goon. Yeah. yeah. Was a goon. In the I didn't original? Last long. In the, the original? first one. Okay. Yeah, the first John Wick. Um, I played a doctor over the course of this last year. I played a hockey player. Yeah, um, your look does lend to many different. I mean, yeah. you're so versatile I've, physically. I've been very, I've been very fortunate to be able to get 
roles that are all over the all over the place. Yeah. I just played a cop for the first time two weeks ago. I mean, you're look, you could be Russian, you could be Croatian, you could be German, you could be um yeah, Northern I could Italian. Be German, yeah. I mean, you see so you've got that look. So people, all my little all my little casting director friends, here we go. Cosytogenes dot com. And I want to thank you so much. Say goodbye to your fans. All right. Thank you all for listening. Peace and love. L- ladies, CauseyTalkGannis.com. Follow him on Instagram, Twitter. What else you got? Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Facebook. Official Kazi Toganus at Kazi Toganus. Twitter is uh, at Standing 8. That's the site for our film. I don't have a personal one. And go rent it. Let's rent it. Rent yeah. it tonight. Yeah. Prime, yeah. Prime Amazon. Video. Amazon, Amazon. Prime Video. And the, and the proceeds go to the Lupus Foundation of America for research. That's right. So help us solve the cruel mystery of lupus so thank you everybody for tuning in we'll see you next week on question ready bye you're listening to question reality with priscilla leona right here on la talk radio